Welcome to another show of Celebrate Life. My name is Gary DeCarlis and I'm your host today. Celebrate Life believes firmly that all people have a story to tell and every life is worth celebrating. I'd like to welcome back today uh, our guest Todd Lockwood. Uh, we have we uh, had a wonderful conversation a couple months ago, and we, did. and we need to continue that today. <laughs> so welcome back, Todd. Thank you, Gary. So there's two things I know in particular that we wanted to touch on. One is the Brodigan Library, yes. and that story is quite amazing. Yes. And then yes. there's uh, a story about a woman named Melissa Fisher. Yeah, uh, Marcella. Marcella. Okay. Yeah, Marcella Thank you. Fisher. Marcella yeah. Fisher. So. Um, Start where you'd like to start. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, you know, I, I wanted to just start by saying, uh, you know, this, this uh, look back that we have been doing here, uh, you know, it's got me uh, realizing uh, what, a, what a, uh, a lucky guy I am, you know, to have had such, an, such a life and, um, and it continues. Mm -hmm. You like <laughs> my, that? I, I, I feel very lucky. I, my guardian angel has definitely been... Uh, looking out for me for a long time That's and great. Um, and you know with the good luck has come you know there's been some tragedy as well as we yep. talked about before my yep. you know I lost my youngest brother in a in an accident in Burlington and um, back in 1987 and um, and actually uh, two years later I lost my sister Mm. Uh, in a uh, United uh, Airlines uh, crash in Sioux City, Iowa. Wow. Uh, it was a big DC-10 that uh, crash landed wow. out there. And um, so, you know, what, what these events um, have done to me is energized me. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes me want to do those things, those things that you think of, yes. hey, there's a cool idea, yeah. but then you never do it, you right. know, and right. this is, the, the, these, these events, uh, these losses have really supercharged me in a way and um, put a fire under me, mm. you know, and, uh, and so I'm, I've, I'm, when I come up with an idea now, I, tr I immediately try to, try to uh, act on it. Well, that, I would say that's the theme that I picked up from our first interview, that you have an idea and you move on it. Most people don't. I right. mean, they just let them lie. And, right. and because of that, I think your life has been incredible, and many people have benefited from it, uh, yeah. Todd. Yeah, yeah. So when I was, uh, when I was in college... Um, a friend uh, turned me on to Richard Brodigan. He was a, a counterculture author, uh, sort of of the, of the beat generation, mm -hmm. uh, lived in California, wrote uh, poetry and these short novels that were just great fun to read. And they were really about my, li my life, I felt, mm. my generation. They, yeah. were, they were very, very, uh, I, was very I felt very connected to his work. And um, uh, and he he wrote um, uh, ten novels during his during his life mm. and uh, and one of those was um, uh, provocatively titled the abortion and in this story uh, he plays a librarian many of his novels were written in first person which mm. made them all the more fun to read mm. and uh, so he's this hippie librarian in this weird little library in San Francisco uh, and the, 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 the interesting thing about this library is that it only accepted unpublished books nothing published was allowed in the place <laughs> And so people would bring in their life stories, you know, written in three ring binders or whatever, and they'd, they'd get to pick any shelf they wanted to, to put the book onto, and they'd sign it into a big ledger and everything. And so Brodigan, um, it was clear he had thought about this idea for a while before writing it out in, 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 the, in, in, in this novel. Right. And, um, uh, and it, it was so compelling. I just thought, wow, that is so Great, that's such a cool idea. When is somebody going to do that? You know, somebody's got to build this library. 
So I would read that novel once a year. It had a special spot on my shelf in my living room. I would read it once a year. You could read it in a weekend. Mm. And um, I read it every year for 15 years. Mm. And finally, when I got to the 15th year, it changed from when is somebody going to do this to when am I going to do this, wow. you know? Wow. And it was actually, um, it was actually losing my brother that pushed me, you know, it's one of the yeah. things that got me yes. in, the, in the state of mind to do it. Yes. And then something else happened is that I, I went to see the movie uh, Field of Dreams hmm. uh, just by chance. Mm. And I'm sitting there in that movie, and we're, you know, about halfway into it, and I'm just in a trance, and I'm like, oh, my God, <laughs> this magic baseball field that this guy was building in his, you know, on his right. farm out in Iowa, right. that was the Brodigan Library, as far as I was concerned. That was the, that that was was the magic library. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, the, the moment my feet hit the sidewalk I, outside the theater, I just knew exactly what I what I had to do, yep. you know, to get this thing rolling and yep. and see it uh, become a real place. What year know? was that, Todd? That um, that would have been in uh, 1989. 1989. Yeah, okay. and um, and so uh, so the, literally the next day, I got on the phone. I started calling up people I know around Burlington to see if they would be interested in serving on on a board, a library board for this. <laughs> unique place, you know. Every every, all ten people I asked said, said yes. yes. Yep, all of them. Boom, just you know. Interesting. Uh, the first guy I asked, Jack Hurley. He was a restaurateur in the area. He had created the Black Rose Cafe in Winooski, uh, sneakers in yes, Winooski, yes. and then later, um, and this is with a a, a partner, uh, a, a friend of his that he was doing these with. Um, uh, Ken Russack. Uh, they also did the Daily Planet. Right. And, yes. And, um, yes. Anyway, Jack, Jack was classic. As soon as I, you know, described the thing in a couple of sentences, he said, "I'm in." That's all he said. "I'm in." And thank you, Jack. <laughs> and I went on to the next <laughs> call. You know. <laughs> so anyway. Um, so you got your board. So we got our board and. The, the, we had a really interesting challenge on our hands. We were taking a fictional idea and making it into a real place that functioned. Yeah. yeah. That functioned. Right. You know. Right. Now, it happened that Brodigan's fictional version of the library um, didn't actually have any readers. People <laughs> never came in to read the books. Interesting. The book, it was really all about oh just God. having a it was the idea of the place that he thought would make it appealing to writers you know the the having a repository for right. your one copy of your work that's been on your shelf forever you know right. you haven't been able to get it published uh yeah. so here's a place to actually uh, for it to sort of live you know yes. and uh have sort of a life you know well we thought oh no let's take this to the next level we want to actually have people come in and and browse through the collection and see if mm -hmm. there's anything interesting in there and um, and that's ultimately what happened after we opened in April of 1990 it took about six months to get this all figured out and get uh -huh. it all you know ready to go we rented a space, so it was actually a used, uh, it had been a used bookstore on L Lower College right, Street. Right, I remember. And, um, and we had, uh, you know, volunteer librarians filling in. The whole operation was volunteer. There was no money changing hands, you know. It was all volunteer thing. Wow. And uh, so we had, a, we had uh, close to 100 people in Burlington were involved in the place in some capacity, wow. mostly as librarians. Yeah. And so being a librarian there was the coolest thing because you'd be sitting there, there might be nobody walking in for the first couple hours of your shift. And then all of a sudden, you know, a couple would walk in who had just flown to Burlington from Dallas or from L.A. No. just to spend uh, some time in the, in the uh, Brodigan Library. They'd read about it in the news and everything. The media, by the way, went, the it, media went crazy with this, it, yeah. national media. It, and, it, wow. you know, they're, they're, 
Oh my gosh, uh, I mean, it's starting with, um, I was on All Things Considered on NPR almost like the day we <laughs> opened or the day after we opened, you know. Unbelievable. And, then it, and we, you know, the New York Times picked it up immediately. I was on the front uh, cover of the Wall Street Journal. Really? Um, it, it just, you know, it just uh, Snowball. started snowballing. And, um, uh, and so people are hearing about it. In fact, there was a point where um, I was traveling a bit. Some of the traveling was to do some of these interviews. I did a, yeah. an interview on a um, CBS News program uh, in their studios in Washington, D.C. I had to fly down there for that. But I, I realized that, um, y you know, there was about a one in four chance that the person I would be sitting next to on the airplane would have already heard of the Brodigan Library. I would ask them, have you ever heard of something called the Brodigan Library? You know, they go, oh, yeah, I just read an article about that. Oh, you my know? goodness, <laughs> you Todd. Know? That's the place that takes oh unpublished God. books, right? You know? <laughs> oh, my. Now, how did you get manuscripts in there. I mean, I with the help of the media, you know, the they're getting the, the word out. So part and of that was to say bring your Well, what 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 uh, we did is we had a standard application form that the writer would fill in. Everything right. was accepted by the way. And that was one of the important right. tenets right. of uh, Brodigan's fictional library was there was no judging going on. Right. No judging at all. It was all about the writer coming up with something they felt was appropriate yeah. to put in this public collection. And so, um, huh. so uh, the media uh, was helping put the word out. I, whenever I'd get interviewed, which was many, many times, I would always ask them to include, or let me include at the end of the interview, just send $2 to P.O. Box 512 in you know, Burlington, Vermont, and uh, and we'll send you a, a writer's uh, yep. form so that you because we we there's certain information we felt we we needed you know we right. wanted to be able to be able to easily get in touch with right. the author if we needed to. No, you uh, now for just to, to be uh, transparent, I have a manuscript in that library. That's right. And That's right. Don't, <laughs> did, don't you? Didn't you also give them a certificate? Oh yes. That's yeah. After we get the. The, 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 um, yeah, it would usually arrive in manuscript form. Mm -hmm. Some people uh, had actually gotten their, their books self-published and it was already bound and everything. So wow. that was great. We took wow. those yeah. two, you okay. know, assuming they were not commercially published, you right. know. Yeah. And um, now if someone, if, if, if another little rule that we came up with was if a manuscript gets published after we get it, it's allowed to stay in the Brodigan okay. collection, yep. you know. Yep. And that happened a few times. Interesting. But it's important to remember that that wasn't our mission. Right. We weren't trying to uh, create opportunities for writers. We were simply yep. providing this magical place for their manuscript to live forever after, exactly. you know. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't about uh, you know, you know, creating a, a publishing uh, opportunities. Yeah, you know, I, I guess, yeah, you could have had uh, publish publishing agents when the library got big enough, maybe to have publishing agents coming up to Burlington. I was wondering if that happened. And, and searching through the collection yeah. for something they might be interested in, uh, in publishing. But, uh, and that, yeah, that may have happened a, a few times. Uh, we, you know, where, where we might not have even been aware, they might have been right. just, being a member of the public in there, you know. <laughs> but now there was one case that was really interesting, where where a guy who um, uh, this is on a on a weekday when we normally weren't weren't open, and this this guy was um, a uh, a lawyer in L.A., young lawyer in L.A. Mm -hmm. uh, who in his, I guess in his forties maybe, who decided to drop out for a while just mm -hmm. and and get back to his roots. And he had been a Brodigan fan, okay? okay. So um, he, with a backpack and, uh, you know, no car or anything, he just was hitchhiking around the country, um, he visited every place referred to in Brodigan's book, Trout Fishing in America, which is sort of a, oh, wow. You know, a, a, a really interesting metaphorical look at the U.S. Yeah. back at that in the early '60s. You know, mm -hmm. and um, 
And so this guy was visiting all these places. Well, Vermont is mentioned in the book. So he ended up in Burlington. He's <laughs> walking down College Street with a backpack and comes upon our sign. <laughs> we had a sign out by the sidewalk. Right, right. You know, the Brodigan Library. Right. And then underneath it says, a very public library. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And it looked, it was the classic formal looking library sign. You yep. know, we, we went to lengths to get, let's, you Good. know, let's take this, let's yeah. take ourselves seriously here, you yeah. know. And um, so, uh, yeah. So, so anyway, so that guy, he made his way, you know, there's like a little path that you would follow off the right. sidewalk. Uh, through a garden area, and the mm -hmm. building was set back a bit from the from the streets, yep. and uh, and our door was around the side. So he went back there, and of course found the door. The play found the place was closed, and he's he's peering through the through the the glass door for the longest time, and 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 must have been thinking, wait a minute now, there's something I'm I'm seeing something here, and I've got to figure out what it is. And then he then he realized he had read the abortion. And he meant, oh my God, somebody has created the library in the abortion. <laughs> you know, he figured it out. Oh my God. And the way goodness. we know this is because um, the Vanguard Press, you know, which existed back then, yep. the predecessor to Seven Days, yep. they had an uh, office uh, in, a, in a building right next door, uh, right. brick, you know, yes, brick, brick right. house right next door. And Pamela Polston worked there and her, and she was on our board, by the way. Oh, okay. And so uh, her, win her office window looked out onto the she entrance. She could see this guy. Uh, uh, the entrance of the, of the library and she saw the guy standing there, you know, and finally <laughs> she goes out and, and, you know, says, can I help you, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so she unlocked the door for him, uh -huh. said, go on in, help yourself. Yep. Just, you know, when you leave, just be sure the door locks itself and, um, and enjoy, you know? Oh, and so- <laughs> He must have felt this was yeah. Nirvana. <laughs> it was, yeah, yeah, exactly. There's, there were so many interesting little, little things wow. like that. Um, uh, yeah, just, so just, just Did amazing. you fundraise for this to keep it operational? Yeah, 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 we did some fundraising. We even had, you know, things were donated to the place. Like we found some guy in the Boston area donated his whole collection of original first edition copies of all of Brodigan's works. Wow. Uh, many of them all signed and everything. Oh my goodness. He donated that whole thing to the library. Um, so, uh, so it kept going for uh, about six years. And then, um, uh, oh no, let me actually, let me back up a little mm. bit because there's a great little story here that happened uh, when we were, after we'd been open for about a year, year and a half, um, we got a letter from the Bumbershoot Book Fair, uh, which is uh, held every year in Seattle. So mm. it, at the time, it was the largest book fair in the country, mm. and, and it was, it's held on the World's Fairgrounds there. And, um, and so um, in their letter, they, they were asking us, would you consider um, transporting the library, the contents of the library, to Seattle for one week, oh my and we'll set it up in a in a similar space here at Bumbershoot, and um, and and that we'd love to have Mr. Lockwood come out as well and be you know <laughs> a, a tour guide and show people around, right. Right. and um, and help tell the story and um, goodness and so. And and we're going to pay for everything, by the way. You know, they were they were paying for right. all of it, and so wow. we said, "Well, yeah, sure, we'll do that." You know, so we we put a sign on our door, you know, saying, "Sorry, out of town for the moment." You know. <laughs> oh my God! And it went out there. So here I am, first day with the exhibit all set up and everything, and this middle-aged guy walks up to me, hand big handshake. Oh, you must be Todd Lockwood. And I go, yeah. And he goes, well, I'm Bill Kinsella. And my jaw dropped. Bill Kinsella is the guy that wrote the novel that Field of Dreams is based oh, on. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, my God. And, I, and I, I, I said to him, you have no idea oh, how... My God. Goodness. Incredible it is that you are standing here right now. Oh my God. And and he said, Oh, he says, Oh, well, that's nothing. He said, 
it, were it not for Richard Brodigan, I would not have written Shoeless Joe, which oh was the my. novel yeah. that he wrote that right. uh, Field of Dreams came out of. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. So he, this guy was God. a major, major uh, Brodigan fan himself. <laughs> and I had no idea that, that Field of Dreams and Brodigan were connected in any way, but they were absolutely the Synchronicity yeah. involved in yeah. this is yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he says, you know, we, we're, we're like, talking and I'm just like thinking this is unbelievable you know and I, I you know this is when I feel like there's there's a mm -hmm. there's there's some, well maybe Brodigan himself right. who had who had died years before this right. um, maybe he was pulling some strings you know and making this situation oh, happen right. you know yeah. <laughs> it was just this was too did good did you get a picture of you too I, I we didn't happen to uh, no, but uh, but but he um, he said you know I'm being interviewed on this big Seattle radio station uh, this afternoon. He said, why don't you come along? We'll both be on. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I said, sure, great, let's do it. So we got on that radio station and we're telling the city of Seattle about our our, uh, our meeting at the library yeah. exhibit, you know, and, and the uh, story behind it. Uh, yeah, and the oh. story behind it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so that is wonderful. So there were so many, so many things like this. Um, yeah, that just just these wonderful little and this situations. All, you know, it goes back to that. I'm going to do something about this. Right. If you right. didn't do right. something about right. it, it would have never happened. Yeah. Now, now, one thing that we had to do, we, you know, I, I came up with the idea. We've got to call it the Brodigan Library. I mean, that's just got to be what it's going to be mm -hmm. called. Well, we had to get permission to use the Brodigan name. And mm -hmm. Richard Brodigan only had one surviving relative at that point, his daughter, uh, Ianthe Brodigan, who lives uh, uh, out in uh, California, mm. um, she, um, you know, we had to get, I had to get permission from her. So I wrote her a really nice letter and explained what we're doing, you know, and we're recreating the library and the abortion and we're doing it in Burlington, Vermont, blah, blah, blah. And um, I didn't hear anything for, for mm. I think about two, three months went by. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh boy, you know, now what are we going to do? Right. You know, we're going to have to come up you, with another name come up or with something. another name yeah. or something you yeah. know and then boom there's a letter <laughs> a letter arrives <laughs> Saying, no problem yeah 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 and she said you know i i apologize for taking so long to get back to you but i really needed to think about this because she's had over the years she's had lots of offers to do mm. movies based on brodigan's books yes, and other things yes. and 90 percent of them are Fly by night situations that would have done if they did anything, they would have done a very uh, mediocre job right. at representing her father's work. You know, mm. so mm. she said, uh, she said, there's no question in my mind that you're the right person to 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 do this. And I wow, so time. so we so um, when we got to April for our opening, yeah. we actually f flew her out from. California, and she put the first book on the shelf for us no here in kidding. Burlington. Yeah, wow. a little ceremony, you know. <laughs> so that was that's wonderful. And she's a wonderful person. We, <laughs> you know, we have stayed in touch over the years. And uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, whenever I'm out there, I usually will stop by and yes. and visit uh, she and her husband, and uh, and you know, kind of get caught up on on things. That's, now the library has moved. Yeah. So the li the library. Uh, so we we were in full active mode at our original location for six years. Mm -hmm. And then we started to, you know, it started getting more difficult to get volunteers to fill in all the time slots we needed and everything. And so we eventually made the decision to move it up to the Fletcher. And the Fletcher created a, a, a mezzanine space up there away from the other books mm -hmm. uh, so that it's sort of, we kind of recreated the atmosphere that was in the uh, the College Street uh, Lower College Street uh, yeah. location. One, by the way, one of the one of the tenants in our in our um, in our bylaws is that no two chairs in the library are allowed to match. So there's all this different kind of fun different furniture in the huh. in the place. You know, uh -huh. so we did the same thing. In fact, I think we moved most of those same chairs were moved up to uh, the to Fletcher. the to the Fletcher and set up there, and. Um, 
Wow. Uh, and so it, it didn't, uh, at that point, it wasn't accepting any new works anymore. We were up to about 320 uh, volumes. Okay. And, um, and by the way, we, this is another little thing that our board had to sort of think tank and come up with was, um, it, you know, in Brodigan's fictional library, there was no categorization or anything going on. The writer would just get to put the, there were a bunch of different shelves and the writer would but, get to pick one, you know, yep, and yep. it didn't really matter where it was located because <clears throat> nobody was coming in. We, we uh, looked at the Dewey Decimal System and realized, well, you know what, that's not going to work either because mm -hmm. the Dewey separates fiction and nonfiction. Right. And a lot of the works that we were getting were in the gray area between fiction and mm. nonfiction. So, um, so we developed our own classification system that uh, using 13 uh, subject categories, the last of which was all the rest, it was called. <laughs> so we had a catch-all there in right. case it didn't fit into one of the right. other ones. And it just gave, we wanted it to be uh, convenient for, uh, you know, these people that are flying in from out of town to peruse the collection. They could quickly zoom in to, an, to a category that they knew they'd probably be right. interested in. Interesting. And um, so we ended up uh, naming it the mayonnaise system. The, I, that's right. I remember <laughs> yeah. that. That's yeah, right. Yeah. And that uh, is derived from the fact that in Brodigan's book, Trout Fishing in America, the very last chapter is called the mayonnaise chapter. And in it, he, he mentions uh, always wanting to have uh, ended a book with the word mayonnaise. And indeed, he does, because that <laughs> chapter is the last one, and he, oh the very last goodness. word is mayonnaise. Wow. So um, <clears throat> a friend, of, a friend wow. of my brother, my brother Herbs, uh, actually designed a wonderful uh, mayonnaise uh, bo uh, jar logo that became sort yes. of the, the official logo for the for the um, for the library, wow. and um, it's with Richards on it instead of Hellman's, you right, know. But right. we had we had actual jars of Hellman's on the shelves, thirty-two ounce jars, uh, as bookends. Wow! Um, separating the different uh, categories of books, you know, and uh, so it gave the that turned out to be kind of a genius decision because the books were all eight and a half by 11 inch yep. manuscripts that were hardcover bound. And most of those binders, those bindings were all black, you know, so it just gave the, mm. the collection kind of a monochromatic mm. look. It looked like a, re a research library or mm. something, you know. Did you bind books? Yeah, we had our own bindery. You yeah, did. we set up, I, we made the investment in some binding wow. equipment. And uh, so we would bind those, uh, those manuscripts. Uh, and um, they, they weren't allowed to go out of the place. You right. know, they had to be read in the library. Right. Right. And um, and we'd have the we would print a, a standard uh, cover sheet. So the first page you would see would be this standardized sheet with information about the author. And the author would also supply us with a, um, a synopsis that would mm -hmm. be on that mm -hmm. cover sheet. So somebody perusing could just open up to that first page, read the synopsis. Oh, that's, that's interesting. I think I'm going to take this aside and uh, poke Very through it a bit, you know. So, so where is my manuscript today? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were at the Fletcher for 10 years. They, they kept okay. it there for 10 years. They weren't accepting new works. That would have been too complicated. Yep. But, they, but they were, of course, people were coming in and, and yep. uh, poking through stuff still. And, um, and then, uh, you know, the, the, the collection went into storage for about two years. Mm -hmm and then uh, in my basement. Mm. <laughs> and then, um, meanwhile, I was trying to find a new home for the place, not locally. We were yeah. thinking, okay, let's, let's think big here. And, um, and sure enough, we found a, a group interested uh, in um, Vancouver, Washington, quite interested actually. And the guy that was really sort of the, the central figure there uh, is a Brodigan scholar. He's probably wow. the most knowledgeable person on, on Richard Brodigan alive, wow. you know. And um, in fact, uh, Brodigan's daughter was telling me it's a little spooky to be around this guy for her because uh, he knows right. things about, um, her father. about her father that she doesn't even know, you My know. My goodness. <laughs> so, uh, 
but uh, but that's where it's been ever since. It's still out there. It's it's interestingly it's it's housed in a um, in a local uh, historical museum hmm. that's in a that is in a former Carnegie Library, and the Fletcher here in Burlington Carnegie is also library. a Carnegie exactly. Library, and the two buildings look very similar. Interesting. Except, of course, the Burlington one has that nice new addition on right. it, right. but the original older part is ex almost exactly the same as the one in Vancouver. In Vancouver. Yeah. Wow. So there was another, wow. they did another opening event and stuff out there. Of course, I went out to that and yep. spoke and everything. Yep. And uh, they had a lot of, uh, uh, over the years that it's been there, since 2010, they have had um, a lot of students at Washington State University have been involved in Interesting. it. Interesting. And so they're um, in various capacities, you know. And they've digitized a lot of the collection, too. So you can go on to uh, brodiganlibrary.org now, and you can actually uh, poke through the, the collection online now. We didn't have that capability wow. back in the, in the 90s wow. because the internet was still in its infancy, infancy right. and, and um, we didn't have anybody on our, on our board that had that, that, those skills as well to create all that and get it online and so forth. Unbelievable. So, um, but it, yeah, that is an amazing. Story. <laughs> so there were so many interesting little things. I can't, you know, the more yeah. than we have time to talk about, really. But uh, uh, but yeah, it was it was really an interesting uh, period. You know, uh, well, just fascinating. Well, bravo to you, Todd, well, again for <laughs> thank you thought action. Thank you. And then you never know what's going to happen when you move forward on something. Right, right, it's, right. It's the right, wonder of life. Right. So, um, so uh, yeah, so a couple of, uh, I think it was, you know, a couple of uh, months after my sister died in the plane crash, um, I, you know, I was going through the, the, the beginning stages of, of the loss, you know, the beginning stages sure. of the, the dealing with it, dealing with it uh, psychologically. And, and I said to myself, you know, I had a, um, I had a just, uh, uh, you know, just change the channel and do something else. So I'm, I'm listening to, to uh, NPR and, um, and on comes a story about a woman in Colorado by the name of Marcella Fisher, lives in a little town in, in uh, eastern Colorado, uh, uh, six, has six kids, um, a husband who is uh, disabled, mm. and she's dreamed her whole life of being a country songwriter. Mm. And, and the, the piece on NPR was, was uh, focusing on uh, so, you know, so on something called a song shark, which are basically people that they put these ads in the back of magazines saying, we'll set your words to yeah. music and make your song a big hit, you know. Right. And she, you know, saw one of these listings, said, oh, my gosh, you know, she had already been writing lots and lots of, she wasn't a musician, but she was writing lyrics, country, mm. <clears throat> you know, dozens and dozens of songs hmm. uh, writing writing lyrics for them and um, nothing had gotten published yet she had none of them had been set to music yet and um, so she uh, she jumped at this you know and uh, and of course they kept you know writing her back and saying just we just need another two hundred dollars and then we'll we'll be able to take it to the next level you know yep. And uh, another four hundred dollars, and we'll be in great shape, you know. And by the time she realized that this was a scam, she had, wow. you know, put almost a thousand dollars of her, of her savings into it, you know. And mm. she wasn't somebody that could afford that kind of loss, you exactly. know. Exactly. And um, so I heard this on the on on All Things Considered, and I'm I'm just going, man, you know, that really. Uh, that makes the music business sound like a bunch of creeps, you know, that somebody would take yep. advantage of this yep. woman like that. Yep. So, so I, um, you know, I thought about it and I, I ended up writing a letter to NPR and I said, you know, I, I, I'm back here in Burlington, Vermont. Um, it happens that I, I own a big recording studio here yep. and, um, and we'd like to, we'd like to make good 
on Marcella Fisher's stream, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So uh, uh, if you can, you know, forward my letter on to her, you know, uh, maybe something will, will come of this, yeah. you know. So sure enough, you know, I hear back from Marcella. She's just like, wow, you know, gosh, this is very exciting. And I said, well, yeah, we, we you know, we're, we're going to make we're going to make one really good recording for you of mm -hmm. one song. You know, and you, you pick the song mm -hmm. and we're going to pull together um, a first class band back here, a six piece you know, uh, country and western band, and we we've got players that'll the, some of the best players in Vermont will be mm -hmm. playing on this thing. You know, so so um, uh, so we we you know we started. Uh, I started asking these musicians, "Would yeah. you like to be part of this project?" You yeah. know, and they said, "Absolutely, totally, yeah, totally want to do this." You know, and uh, <laughs> so. Uh, so we recorded the the rhythm section uh, and used uh, Little Joyce Cooper, the uh, vocalist in Vermont. She uh, sang uh, the lead vocal, but the intention was that um, we were going to give Marcella a crack at actually singing hmm. the lead vocal once we got the rhythm stuff down. Yep. And and so what I did is I called I I um, called a, a, a pretty good recording studio in the Denver area and said, um, explained what we were doing, you know, and um, would you, would you, you know, would you help us out on this? There's yeah. no money involved here. We're, yeah. you know, this is just a goodwill thing, you know, and, um, and they said, yes, we, you know, we, nice. absolutely, nice. You know, we, we nice. want to be part of it, you know, so, nice. so, uh, so Marcella, it was no problem at all. She would just lived an hour away, you know, so she was able to get herself there and, okay. uh, uh, she didn't have, she, you know, she wasn't, uh, she was an okay singer, mm -hmm. but a fantastic songwriter. I mean, the, so the song is called Thank You, Jesus, for Just That Man. Wow. <laughs> you know? oh, oh. I mean, you don't get any Jeez. more real than that, you know. Yep. And, um, and so, uh, wow. uh, so I sent a, a multi-track tape to the, uh, to the uh, studio in Denver that we had already pre-mixed the rhythm section on a couple of tracks on that tape, and we yeah. also had on a separate track, uh, Little Joyce Cooper's uh, uh, scratch vocal, yeah. and uh, and so they had lots of extra tracks to to record Marcella on, and uh, so she took you know they did like four or five takes, and uh, with each one she got a little bit better at, wow. at it. You know, I wow. gave I had sent her a cassette ahead of time so she could. Uh, practice mm -hmm. hear the melody because they the guys back here actually wrote this wrote the music too they wrote the melody for this so she song. wrote the lyrics she wrote the lyrics this your crew wrote the music wrote the music and and arranged it and arranged came up it. with the arranging and everything Did you she know, like had, it uh, yeah oh she was floored <laughs> you know we had gordon stone on pedal steel you know and mm -hmm. uh, jeff salisbury on drums and uh, you know, Mark Ransom on bass. I mean, it was wow. just a superb uh, assemblage of, of wow. players, you know. And wow. uh, uh, so, so, um, uh, so she, you know, we we managed to get a half decent uh, vocal out of Marcella. Mm -hmm. They sent the tape back. We did a final mix of it, and then I, what, it, what, you know, to make it even sound better, we we put um, Joanne. Uh, little Joyce Cooper was was put in there, but uh, doing kind of harmonies, yeah, uh, yeah, two yeah. different harmony parts yeah. behind Marcella, you right. know, which really made it sound totally professional, you know. Mm. So so that was great, you know. And I said to Marcella, you know, you're th this is not going to make you pr may not make you a dime, you know, right. but you're right. gonna you're gonna enjoy hearing your. Your, your lyrics, lyrics coming through live. in this way you, for the first time, that's, that's pretty mm. exciting stuff, you mm. know? <laughs> so, so, so I, you know, I had a friend, um, after we got to that point, um, you know, we started thinking about, okay, how can we get this thing out there, out into the world, you right. know? And um, I, my, when my when my um, sister passed away in that United uh, plane crash, they were, uh, United 
did this thing where they pulled middle management people out of their Chicago headquarters and assigned each one of them to a different family. These were all families who had lost somebody in the, mm. in the plane crash. Mm -hmm. And there was a woman uh, uh, at their Chicago headquarters uh, who was assigned to our family. And, and we had a special phone number. If we called that number, she, before she even answered, she would know that it was a member of our family, you know, calling, you know. So I called her up and I said, hey, it had been a while, you know, it had been a, a, mm -hmm. a, been a, a um, I think actually it had been close to a year since the, all that was going on. Mm. And, um, uh, and I, I said, uh, you know, it's Todd Lockwood. I um, um, don't know if you remember me, but um, I explained the project and I said, by any chance do you, do you know anybody at United who works in the on-air music uh, area, you know? And right. she said, oh yeah, they're in an office right down the hall from me, you know? <laughs> so oh so, uh, so I said, well, I'm gonna send you a, a copy of the, of the final recording on a real, t on a, you know, reel to reel, um, and, and um, maybe you could run it by them and see if they might be able to work it in somehow, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, sure enough, Three months later, it appears in the in-flight magazine, no. the listing under the country channel. Marcella Fisher, you know, oh thank you, my. Jesus, for just that man, you know. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> and it was on every United aircraft for two months oh. <laughs> on the country channel. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> So that was pretty cool. Oh, that, uh, yeah. What did, what did <laughs> yeah. Marcella think about that? She was floored, just <laughs> floored, you know. And then, and she's a go-getter too. So she she had um, some, you know, friends in the military, and she contacted them. We were in uh, the U.S. was uh, in Iraq at that mm -hmm. point, and um, in the Iraq War, and so she. Uh, uh, she managed to get through to the Armed Forces Radio Network and said, I've got this recording I've done of a song that I think the troops might oh my <laughs> really like, you know. Yeah. And sure enough, boom, it's playing over all the bases in Iraq. Oh all my the U.S. bases were hearing, God. thank you, Jesus, for just that man several times a day, you wow. know, <laughs> so wow. really, really cool, really cool. What's happened to her? Have you kept in touch? Um, we did for a few years after that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I've sort of, it's been a long time now, yeah, so yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure that she's still around. I think she would probably be, uh, you know, somewhere around 80 years old now, you know, yeah. but um but a very sweet, My sweet goodness. person, you know. You made I, her uh, dreams come true. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, wow. Uh, so yeah, it was it was really, really um, an interesting one that just sort of had legs, you know. Todd, you're so. a dream maker. You are. <laughs> well, thank you. you. Are. <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, I I just feel compelled to do stuff like this, you know. And I and and, and here I have it sitting on this beautiful recording studio, and it right. wasn't. We weren't booked, or you know, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. We had, we had time to. I, I could, I could, inv you know, invest time in a project like that, and it didn't cost anything right. for me to do that. Right. right. So why not? You know. Right. That's beautiful. Um, yeah. Does any like a recording like that? Does it ever turn into a a, a disc? A. a um, it no, it no, no, no. And no. It, I, I actually was digging through my archives uh, the other day and found the master tape to that project. Mm. I don't even have a machine to play it right now, but mm -hmm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get that master copied to a format that I can, that mm -hmm. I can post online. You know, because uh, it would be fun to hear it again and and and. Uh, you know, and be fun to play it on this show. Yeah, yeah, it would be. It mm -hmm. would be. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'm going to see if you can do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I may have to go to a. Uh, there's a mastering lab that I've used in Portland or uh, Portland, Maine, rather. Uh, that I think uh, that I know can do it. You know, they can make that transfer for me. There'd be nobody around here that would have uh, a machine to do it. Yeah. But, right. but, uh, uh, but yeah. Um, yeah, we could well, <clears throat> make that happen. That's great. It's been a delight having you on the show. <laughs> really great Both to be times. back, Gary. Thank you. Really great. All right. Thank you. <laughs>